Hello guys and welcome to Supreme Ruler Ultimate. Today I'm going to be making a guide on the units of Supreme Ruler Ultimate and clever ways to micromanage them to accomplish tasks in a way that the primitive AI of this game cannot. If you haven't already seen my war tutorial, I suggest watching that before this as I'm going to assume you know the basics of the game and war from that already. It's in the cards at the top right in a playlist if you'd like to see it and other guides that I have created for this game. I'm going to take this one tab at a time and I'm going to go basically just top to bottom, make references where I need to, and so we'll be starting with infantry under the land designs. Infantry are a hybrid offensive and defensive unit. They are probably your most versatile units. In some timelines in this game, they can stand up to tanks and in others, all you need is a couple artillery batteries to wipe them out. Speaking of, given that this game spans World War I to postmodern day, I'm gonna do my best to tell you as much as I can on the relevance of a unit within the entire timeline. Thankfully, in modern day, I can see quite a lot of the units here just by default. So if we look, for example, we have foot-based infantry, from roughly World War I, a little bit after, this is the most basic infantry you will ever be working with. Now there's a good difference between foot-based infantry and motorized or mechanized infantry, which I'll go over them one by one. Foot-based infantry, these are your most defensive type of infantry and they are also the most prone to the attacks of motorized mechanized units and artillery. Usually, they are soft targets, which means when someone is attacking them, their soft attack here is what's going to be used rather than their hard attack, unless you're in a close combat location like a jungle or a city, in which case the close attack value will be used against them. Being the most primitive type of infantry, foot-based infantry are usually the cheapest as well with low annual maintenance costs, low price to build, sometimes low times to build them that can get a little complicated in world war ii given that these infantry are foot based they usually cannot go very quickly as you see here very very slow which as opposed to even just comparing it to mounted infantry from pre-world war ii we can see here 45 versus six so that's a big speed difference that also changes the viability of transportation. Now this will go for all motorized versus non-motorized units for all the different categories we look at. In terms of land-based units, if they're not motorized or mechanized, usually the most efficient way to transport them is by rail so that they move at an increased speed thanks to the speed of the train they're on or by sea so that they move the speed of the transport or air. Moving them by road is not nearly as efficient as moving something that has wheels or tracks, and moving them without a road or rail or any other kind of transport is going to be very, very slow. Because foot-based infantry are so cheap, these are generally what you want to be using if you're playing a smaller, poorer nation. One thing to note is they generally don't require any fuel at all, and even if they do say they do, they actually don't. They can always move, no matter if they have fuel or not, the only thing is they need to be in supply line to restock their ammo. Generally, foot-based infantry also require more personnel than motorized or mechanized infantry, so if you have manpower problems, these may not be your most efficient tool. Their profile is very high, generally, which is actually their stealth rating, renamed, so these are also the perfect units to, if you have loyalty line of sight penalties on, you could actually sneak through or pass the front lines of an enemy nation by using infantry. And if you were going to do that, you'd actually want to go to your ROE and change their approach right here from the default capture enemy land to land not captured. That's a very special use for them. In terms of combat between different units, Foot-based infantry has their biggest strength in close combat, and that means close defense and close attack ratings. These are, as I said, more defensive. You want to position them in cities or jungles or have them fight over those regions. Think commandos or the Viet Cong. Would the Viet Cong have done as well as they did if they ran around with half tracks and tanks? No, of course not. And would France have done better against them if they were using foot-based infantry more and less World War II tanks and jeeps? Of course they would have. Not only generally will these kinds of infantry get a bonus 
in close combat locations and defense bonuses of course also modified by the fact that things like planes and RD simply cannot really breach close combat and defensive locations as well. But in terms of jungles, motorized and mechanized infantry, not only are their stats going to be terrible, but they're going to have terrible supply issues moving through close combat locations whereas infantry can just move as much as they want because they don't need fuel. So to sum up, foot-based infantry have their greatest strength in close combat locations and situations, and their weakest point is out in the open, especially versus entrenched enemy artillery, or later, tanks. Now let's move on to motorized infantry, and now I'll take care of motorized and mechanized generally all at once. So mounted infantry from World War II, as we can see, is a soft target just like the foot-based infantry we were just looking at. But there's mechanized infantry. If we look at the allocator from modern day, this is infantry, but it's a hard target because it's using an IFV. In practice, motorized and mechanized infantry have a lot of the same benefits, but their main differentiator is what kind of arms the enemy will have to use to actually damage them, or in the case of the game, what stats the enemy is going to have to use to damage them. Now looking back at the mounted infantry because their older stats are much easier to digest, this is where you get a much different play style. Motorized and mechanized infantry are far more offensive. These are what you want to be using in a push or charge, less in defensive situations or war of attrition. Their stats for most of the game are going to be inferior to their foot base counterparts. They are also going to cost more money. Now that changes a little in modern day. In modern day, foot-based infantry are far more irrelevant and used almost exclusively for cheap defensive jobs. Whereas in the rest of the game, these foot-based infantry would be good in offense positions and war of attrition, and also just trying to push through weaker motorized or mechanized infantry that don't quite have the stats to hold up. The motorized mechanized infantry main strength is the fact that they can deploy into a combat zone in between them very very quickly because they have a massive speed buff and this is with no modifiers now if they move on rails they're going to be moving the same speed as foot-based infantry are this is where roads come in handy honestly off-road the mounted infantry for example motorized mechanized would still probably move faster than an infantry would on rails but the speed bonus by using roads with mechanized and motorized units is especially evident and these things will win an entire war before foot-based infantry can even reach the front now their strength is of course going to be fighting generally on open fields and generally not close combat locations now there are exceptions Notably, especially engineer motorized and mechanized units tend to be way better about this than their non-engineer counterparts. And in modern day specifically, mechanized motorized units become a lot more versatile. But for most of the game, you don't want to be using these in close combat locations. You want to be using them in open fields where they have pretty good generally all around stats. They can move pretty far and pretty fast however their weakness will of course be they need fuel just to move and if you watch my playthroughs you can see that can become problematic real quickly as you move you leave your supply line behind you they need to be supported by transport trucks transport planes or they need to be used not to their full potential in order to not have them become dead in the water think russia's invasion of ukraine when they marched on kiev and all their vehicles were getting stuck on the road because they're running out of fuel. That is exactly it. They did not have the logistical supplies to keep up and the same thing will happen in this game very quickly if you use these units in that way. Generally, their profile is always gonna be lower, meaning they are far worse for stealth because they can be seen easier and also because they'll just get stuck behind enemy lines without supplies unless you're micromanaging supply drops to them, which might be noticed by whoever you're fighting. Being more offensive minded, motorized and mechanized infantry should be used on the offensive in the front line along with your tanks, for example, and your recon as they will generally be cheap as well as your recon as you can generally look at them as the pasta of this frontline meal, or if you're Asian, the rice. Meaning they're a cost-effective way to fill up your frontline, hold the ranks, 
and allow your recon actual leverage to move around and your tanks capabilities to perform breakthroughs and pincers. Now that we've explained a lot of the basics and explained pretty much everything about infantry, let's move on to recon. Now recon are the first offensive, purely offensive, unit that we're going to be looking at. Recon usually has very good stealth ratings no matter what because it's usually supposed to get behind enemy lines. In terms of land units, their spotting ranges are usually the best because, well, they're recon. They're supposed to go in first to see where the enemy is, but also while being combat capable enough to actually support your units on the front in an offensive. There's only really one recon unit that does not require fuel and is not motorized or mechanized, and that is the starting recon back in World War I, which is cavalry. That works like faster infantry that's not quite as good at combat, but still fulfills the role of a recon. In World War I, a cavalry would probably be the closest thing you have to motorized infantry, in fact. Generally, the combat stats of recon are not going to be anywhere near as good as their infantry or tank counterparts. Their job is exclusively to move really, really fast, generally to move pretty far to spot enemies without being spotted. Recon come in motorized or mechanized variants, and if you're using them in combat, which you will be, you want them in part of a bigger force to support an infantry and tank offensive. There, see, those ones are pretty easy to explain. But let's look at a different recon to explain something that a lot of units can also have. So there are these things called amphibious ratings, and you should also look at that as well as air droppable, as well as some other stats here, because it tells you a little more information about how you can actually use each individual units. Now, this is not specific to one type of unit like infantry or recon or tanks. It can be pretty spread out, but you generally want to look at these things for like, can this unit cross a river by itself without an engineer? And if it's an engineer, you pair it up with units that are not amphibious because you stick an engineer on a river hex, for example, and the other units can go over it like a pontoon bridge. There's also pontoon bridges specifically for that purpose, which are much cheaper. They're located under transports and we'll get to them when we get to them. The air droppable, I'll just, you know, can I put this in a plane and drop it? Which I'll make a tutorial about some other time. Engineers can be placed on building sites to speed up building at the cost of, you know, using the resources you were allocating faster, which you might have to account for. There would also be mid-air refuelable, and whether or not something can refuel others in mid-air, and of course, NBC protected, which means will chemical and nuclear warfare be as effective against this unit. For recon, there's even technically non-combat units like mobile radar, which literally just exist to give a gigantic spotting range, more than combat-ready recon units, but of course, they can't fight and they can be destroyed very easily. So be very careful how you use these because the AI is going to get them killed if you're not micromanaging them yourself. Moving on to tanks now, we have the ultimate offensive unit generally in terms of stats. Now tanks are always going to be mechanized. They're pretty much always going to be hard targets, meaning they're going to be weak to the hard attacks of others, which in certain eras gives them a huge strength because not a lot of hard attack can be found earlier on in the eras. A lot of them can also be very, very resistant to artillery, which generally infantry is not. So if you're taking arty fire, you want, and this is where we start combining different unit types together into a cohesive strategy. I'm going to go over that bit by bit as we go through them. You want tanks to be on top of a stack leading an offensive with, if you have other elements in your attack, like infantry and recon, you'd want them to be underneath the tanks. Ideally, you actually want your recon flanking around enemy units, but if you're pairing tanks with infantry, which you usually will be, then you want tanks to be above the infantry because number one, in a straight up fight, their ground defense, so their defense in an open field, not in cities or jungles, mind you, will be better. They'll be able to take the hits better and already attacks on them will be less effective. This makes tanks especially useful for trying to get through entrenched enemy positions and massive pileups of enemy artillery. Of course, they also have the problems of fuel. They're going to be slower than motorized mechanized infantry, but they're still very much beneficial to have on roads and things like that, and they're going to move a lot faster than foot-based solutions. But of course, be wary that their close defense and close attack is generally going to be terrible. 
Tanks are not designed for clearing jungles or mountains or cities. That's really where you want to be using your infantry. And it can be motorized mechanized infantry because they're going to be better at this than tanks. But ideally, this is where you're going to want to be using foot based infantry. And now moving on to anti tank. Now, anti tank's a little more complicated. This is still an offensive unit, technically, but it's a little more hybrid in how you can use it. So the simplest anti tank is going to be your toad anti tank. This is essentially a defensive position that you could put anywhere or even drag along with you on your offensive just beware the speed is not going to be as great as motorized mechanized units so they could fall behind a more modern offensive pretty quickly their defensive stats are not going to be as great so you want to pair them with other units usually their capability to deal with soft targets like infantry is awful so infantry would be a perfect counter to toad anti-tank or almost well, anti-tank and anti-tank should not be put up against waves of infantry however now imagine if that infantry was actually mechanized you see what that means they're going to be hard targets and now the anti-tank is perfect against them so it gets really complicated based on exactly what enemy you're fighting generally speaking they're not going to be the best at clearing cities either as we can see now we also have mechanized anti-tank which is a hard target instead of a soft target as you can expect they move further they move faster this is what you want to use offensively they'll keep up with an offensive the defenses are more well-rounded in essence they become cheaper versions of tanks or more expensive versions of infantry that are more specifically designed for targeting hard targets, such as tanks, such as mechanized infantry, such as mechanized anti-tank. There is, I believe, motorized, yeah, motorized anti-tank as well, which is a soft target still, but comes with other benefits of mechanized, as in the speed and the range, but not the defensive stats that comes with being a hard target. But then they become weak to their own unit type as well. Real life tactics aside, in this game, anti-tank in terms of toad anti-tank should be used defensively once motorized and mechanized anti-tank become a thing. And when you have motorized and mechanized anti-tank, these are really just cheaper versions of the hard attack that comes from certain infantry and tanks. This is what you want to use if your enemy is tank rushing you earlier in the eras or fielding massive amounts of hard targets between their anti-tank, their infantry, and their tanks, and you don't want to risk more expensive actual tanks that have far more versatile uses. So yeah, generally see them as cheaper versions of tanks specifically designed for dealing with hard targets when speaking about mechanized. Also, this is a good time to tell you about demolition units. This just means they're going to do more damage to structures you're attacking, usually represented with fortification attack. Now, generally, engineers are what you want to use here, or bombs, or artillery, but this is only important if you're wanting to destroy enemy fortifications rather than try to kill everyone on them and take them over. Now, moving on to artillery, we have a sort of similar situation here to anti-tank. Now, they're not a cheaper version of anything, mind you, but starting with the simple toad artillery, this is the most common defensive unit you will be using in the entire game. All arty, by the way, is defensive. This is our first one we're going into that is not hybrid with offensive or purely offensive. All artillery is defensive, meaning the last place you want this is on the front line without tanks or infantry on top of it. This design, for example, is Toad, so apply everything I've told you about foot-based infantry and Toad anti-tank here. The defensive stats are going to be terrible. It's a soft target, and this one in particular has indirect ballistic fire. Now this just means that it can shoot over multiple hexes, and this is shown via the range. Now every hex is like 16 square or whatever km so you go from one hex to another that's 16 32 48 meaning that artillery piece we just looked at can fire from here to here which is perfect at keeping it out of the front lines now there's also ranges within hexes to take into account 
but that's the main thing you need to know. As you see, their stats are pretty interesting. Like I said, they're pretty good against fortifications or structures. They're going to be better against soft than hard targets, but they're pretty good against each. They are not good at close attack. So in situations where they're in a city or they're firing into a close combat location, they're not going to do that well. So foot-based infantry in a jungle, for example, can really escape a lot of the harm that artillery can pose. Simultaneously, artillery might be all you have that can actually really hit infantry in a jungle without using your mechanized motorized units if you came unprepared like France in the First Indochina War, and you might just have to fight very inefficiently. And resultingly, as we can see, their defensive stats are not very good, especially against ground. So having them in a field is a terrible idea. They have a little bit of a buff in close defense, so in a city or close combat location, they will have some more defense, and their best defense is going to be to indirect fire, such as other artillery pieces, because you have to, you know, uh, unroot them. They're usually pretty entrenched. Resultingly, they're also this type anyway, usually really cheap, and they're going to make up the bulk of your defensive forces, so you're going to want to build a lot of them. Their spotting isn't so great, so this is especially where recon comes in handy. You can use recon to spot enemies for arty that are playing defensively or offensively as part of a bigger force. Another important thing to note about artillery is that when they do fire on a hex, they hit everything on the hex be it your units be it the enemy units the, the thing to note is every unit on that hex will take damage so if someone's overstacking a hex that's supposed to only have five units with more like a hundred units if you can get a giant arty force blasting them you can slaughter that buildup of enemy forces now let's take a look at mechanized and i believe if you look far enough back there's also going to be motorized artillery and you know we've talked about the differences between them but let's take a look at mechanized artillery here generally now we're talking about hard targets when they're motorized they'll be soft so you don't have to worry about anti-tank and stuff like that but now they're hard targets which means they're going to be even more susceptible to anti-tank which is a cheaper solution to dealing with them now. But of course, they're going to move much faster, motorized or mechanized. But they're also going to need fuel now, which is a problem. As you can see, the close attack and combat stats are just as bad, even on motorized mechanized forces here. But their defenses against enemy artillery becomes even greater because artillery is already bad enough at cracking hard targets. Compound bad hard attack on amazing indirect defense and mechanized artillery becomes great at avoiding enemy artillery. Motorized, not quite as good at this, but you know, mechanized is also more expensive and comes with other weaknesses. Motorized and mechanized artillery, while still being defensive units, these are, at the end of the day, gonna be the best you have at supporting an offensive. The towed artillery, after a certain era, is just not going to keep up. So mechanized motorized artillery is what you're going to want going behind motorized or mechanized infantry and tanks and offensive recon because they will keep up and they will be able to pack a big punch. But note they are also way more expensive. So you might not be able to afford these to begin with. One thing to note is there is a difference between indirect ballistic fire and indirect missile fire here. Uh, the difference is usually in damage range, but also artillery that has indirect missile fire usually has the ability to actually pack missiles and have a missile capacity. So the HIMARS, for example, you can use any missiles that you produce that are land based on these. The otherwise first missile launcher you will get is going to be an actual dedicated basic missile launcher which is gonna look something like this, where they can't actually shoot like regular artillery. They must use missiles. This is very, very good for land-based nukes, land-based missiles when you don't already have something like the HIMARS, which can be arty and a missile platform. But generally, this is pretty OP later on in the late Cold War and modern day when missiles start to dominate the battlefield because this could artificially increase your range. Like sure, your arty actual attack may only be 44, which is almost three hexes away, almost. 
but your missiles might be able to go a hundred plus, which we know from Ukraine, you know, that's how far the, the HIMARS can shoot with the right missiles. Not to mention there's the platform and possibility for shooting land-based nuclear solutions. Now we move on to the second most prominent defensive unit in the game, air defense, which has the same foot based and towed. Oh, actually they have both. Yeah. Versus mechanized and motorized setups we've encountered before. Yeah. So there is foot based, literally foot based anti-air in this game. You don't get this kind of shit until much later, like in the cold war and modern day, this is the epitome of having a cheap defensive anti-air solution. Now, if you can't already figure it out, anti-air is great because it's very defensive against enemy air and it's gonna take out enemy air targets. Do not put it up against other kinds of units, but for example, as we see Toad anti-air from like World War II actually has a semi-decent close attack for the time period. That's because you could literally take it and point it at enemy infantry, despite it being meant to shoot up. Now, probably not every air is gonna be like this, yeah. Like the Patriot systems, you can't really point these missiles down and aim them at infantry, that's not gonna be a thing. But these ones have extremely potent anti-air defense as opposed to towed anti-air like you would have in World War II. So of course, the thing to note is foot-based infantry cannot move very fast. Toad can move five times faster because it is towed. So they're gonna be a little more mobile than foot-based. Foot-based literally just never use it outside of defensive situations because by the time you get them, everything's gonna be motorized and mechanized anyway. And a soft target with no defensive stats except against air, just running through the fields is going to get slaughtered by enemy recon. And that's what your own recon could be good for, is slaughtering stuff like this. But Toad as well isn't much of an exception. Its defensive stats all around the board aren't as great. Its anti-air actually isn't as great in terms of defense as foot base for obvious reasons. It's a bigger target. And once you get into motorized and mechanized anti-air, now you're gonna start getting into the usual problems of motorized mechanized. You need fuel. Now, of course, if you haven't guessed, motorized mechanized anti-air, this is what you're going to want to accompany your offensive force, especially later in the game, to deal with any pesky bombers or multi-role fighters that end up going for your targets. Not only that, but anti-air is going to be your primary defense against enemy missiles, meaning this is what's going to protect you in the late game in modern day and late Cold War from enemy missile strikes and in world war ii you even look at stuff like these toad anti-air your anti-air is the only thing you're going to have to defend you against nukes in that the anti-air can literally just shoot the plane delivering the atom bomb out of the sky or in terms of a lot of actual nukes they'll be mid-air targets instead of close air targets a lot of missiles will be like this as well and you'll need complicated anti-air platforms just to shoot them down but you can shoot them down even like a lot of sub-base nukes for example you'll be able to actually shoot these things down now your fighters could intercept them as well but anti-air is a cheaper solution that you could actually place wherever you want but do note that there are three different levels of air that you'll have to fight close medium and high as i explained in the war guide so you'll also need to pick the correct anti-air based on your targets here close air which is zeppelins helicopters and some planes and a lot of missiles can be shot down by your fellow stinger and your fellow towed gun which usually also have mid-air this one just doesn't but high air things are going to be especially hard to hit like this is the best probably anti-air we're starting out with very mechanized very good here and so it's going to be very good at deploying on the front it has very good close and mid attack and it has some high air attack high air targets tend to be more fragile than other air targets so you don't need as much attack but it's also just hard to hit that high in a lot of these instances just for the record looking at things like the patriots here uh this is a little misleading yes it is 
technically motorized because it moves like super fast, but it's towed. Look at this like a very advanced towed launcher. It's still more defensive as opposed to something that is wheeled, but it's still very expensive compared to more basic systems because it's modern. Comparing these things over a hundred years of military technology is actually kind of difficult to do but I hope I'm doing it well. Finally, under land designs, we have transports. Now transports are gonna be pretty simple to explain. The main role of transports generally is to deliver supplies. And you can see that in their cargo capacity. This shows how much tonnage of supplies they can carry. And they're gonna be needed because they're gonna be carrying you know, supplies and fuel in one handy bundle and just distributing this to all your mechanized motorized units that are up pushing the front that need fuel to continue pushing and even foot-based infantry that need supplies to continue shooting. Your supply lines will do this as well. This is a way to get supply into zones that don't already have supply. The optimal way to use these is to fill them up somewhere like a city, for example, and let's say you're pushing up to Ottawa and then your supply line isn't keeping up. Then you want to send the supply trucks up, deliver their supplies, and once they're empty, send them back to the nearest supply hub, such as a military complex or some other towns, for example, and then send them back up. This is micromanagement we're talking about here. And the AI is not going to do all this for you. The AI will do a good job of actually deploying them to places that are low on supply, but not so good at the resupplying them part. When looking at cargo capacity, we also start to deal with the capability that units can pick up and load other units that are within a certain tonnage and then transport them somewhere faster. For example, foot-based infantry should be pretty light and can be picked up and then moved somewhere else. But then we also have under transports, bridging units. Now these are kind of like engineers minus the engineer part. They'll serve the bridging function for a very cheap price. Now, a lot of these, especially old ones, you know, they're not, well, this one's actually pretty expensive despite its age. World War II ones are gonna be pretty squishy, but their defenses get better because usually they won't have any offensive stats. Their whole job is to be a bridge and survive that. So you could put them, for example, right here on a wide river hex so that your other units can move over it as if it was a bridge. So you don't ever have to worry about a bridge getting shot out if you have these kinds of units, but you have to know how and where to use them because guess what? The AI is not going to use them. In fact, the AI is not even gonna build them unless you do that yourself. Next, we're getting into air designs. And the thing to note is that air is not gonna win a war for you. So let's go from top to bottom. We have helicopters. At the beginning of the game, these won't even be available, except in the form of zeppelins, which get classified as helicopters in this game, which are complicated and yet simple, because they don't fill the role that helicopters do, they just share the close air target status of them. You basically look at zeppelins like big tanky strat bombers, but they only really apply to Germany. Everyone else's zeppelins are just big air recon units, which would be more like patrol, but we'll get to that when we get to that. Other helicopters in general, you can kind of get an idea of what to expect from these from real life, right? These are close air targets, which makes them the most vulnerable of all the air targets. They can be shot by even the most simple AA systems. A symbol like this just shows whether or not they can land and refuel on carriers. Something that makes helicopters special though, unlike every other air unit typically, is the fact that they don't need to operate out of an air field or an air base. They can hover anywhere and refuel from your natural supply because ideally, you know, they could just land and then access the natural supplies in the area. The thing about helicopters is they come in a lot of different forms and can be spread across a lot of different categories. Under the actual helicopter category, is where you're most likely to find attack helicopters. This won't be the case at the beginning of the game because the beginning of the game and helicopters are just so rudimentary and crude. But for the second half of the timeline here, we have attack helicopters. You know, they're not gonna be very good against planes or anything. For the most part, there'll be an exception here or there. Their main job is to attack enemy targets. And in the case of a helicopter packing missiles 
like the Apache or sorry, rockets. They can be very good against enemy tanks. Maybe not as good against soft targets. And they can also take on enemy helicopters or other close air targets, which can even involve nukes. All air targets move very, very quick, faster and faster as technology develops, of course. Their spotting range isn't half bad. The profile of helicopters is usually going to be higher because they can fly low to the ground and thus they're harder to pick up. So they can be very good at assisting stealthy operations. They're going to have some good defense to land-based systems to make up their vulnerability, but they're not going to be as good when trying to assault cities. A lot of air is not going to be good for that or jungles, you know, close combat locations. You might have to use them, but that doesn't mean they're gonna be good at it. And they're not gonna be very good defending themselves against enemy air, and especially not artillery. Because look at it this way. If artillery is hitting them, that means they've landed to resupply because you're keeping them in a dangerous location and they're just getting bombed the fuck out of. And helicopters can be especially vulnerable to that. But now in addition to helicopters, like the Apache here, we also have ASW helicopters, which well, let's find. Eh, okay, this works. Generally, their offensive stats for soft and hard attack are going to be non existent, and sometimes they won't even, like, literally have them at all. Instead, they'll have anti sub equipped, which is just a way of saying, hey, these are going to be really, really good at going after submarines. Very good to use more defensively instead of offensively supporting a push. They're going to be cheaper and they're going to have less stats overall. There are some helicopters in the game that are kind of designed to do both, but they're very rare and I can't even find any here right now. But these are the kinds of helicopters you want to use more defensively or I guess offensively if you want to hunt down a large patch of enemy submarines you might know about. Their spotting is going to be way higher due to needing to spot enemy submarines and keep up with their profile. And of course, they're very fast. And one thing to note is helicopters can also carry missiles. So you could put things on here like anti-ship, anti-land. You can fit a lot of things. When we come to air units, the later you get into the game, the more pretty much every single type of air unit is going to be able to pack missiles. But the size is going to limit what exactly you can put on them. Don't expect to take nukes on a helicopter, for example. Expect only more basic missile types. Interceptors! Now, come on. This should be really obvious. These are high reaction. Not always. The older ones can be more medium or even low. Fighters that are designed for taking down enemy planes. They have good air defense. They have good ground defense. They're usually gonna be mid targets, but there's some high and close ones, which have all the benefits and debuffs of being high and close. The lower they are to the ground, generally the better their combat capabilities because they can fit more weight on them because they don't have to maintain as high of an altitude. We're seeing even higher spotting distances here and otherwise there's not much to say here. You know, fighters, you go blow up enemy planes with them. What, what else are you gonna use these for, you know? Some of them have multi-role capabilities, but generally speaking, you want them escorting planes that are going after ground targets or just clearing an airspace by themselves. Like if the enemies raid you, interceptors, which are very fast and very good at shooting down air targets, are what you want to send after them. The ground defense can help defend them against anti-air, but of course, be careful with these. As you see, they're also really, really weak to indirect defense, which means if they're in their air bases, which they need to be in air bases and air fields in order to resupply and repair, they're literally sitting ducks, so keep an eye on them. In terms of all aircraft, the ones that are closer to the ground are going to be able to do more damage. The mid-range ones are really balanced, and the high air ones, while fragile, are perfect if you want to send something in that can avoid most air detection systems in the game, especially depending on what era you are in. Not to mention, a lot of high air planes can also just avoid mid-air interceptors shooting them down. Now moving on to tactical bombers, these are your inverse to interceptors. Their air defense isn't going to be as good, their defense in general isn't going to be as good. They're pretty much never going to be high air attack, maybe there's one or two towards like the end of the game, but these are what you're going to send in to actually deal damage to enemies. Primarily, in most scenarios and most designs, you're going to use them for taking down enemy soft and hard targets. 
Your success against fortifications or structures will vary based on the era, but these are also going to carry, of course, some more missiles of themselves. Generally, you want air-to-ground missiles on something like attack bomber and air-to-air -air missiles on something like an interceptor. You want interceptors protecting tactical bombers, and that's the ideal way to use them. Whereas your helicopters will be more paired with your offensive infantry forces or your defensive coastal defenses rather than being paired with planes. And then we have multi-role fighters, yes. So this is the best of both worlds in terms of fighters and tack bombers. Or, depending on who you ask, maybe the worst of both worlds. They're going to be able to handle themselves in multiple, numerous situations. Whether you want them going after ground targets, they can handle it. Whether you want them going after air targets, they can handle it. Generally, an interceptor is going to survive an enemy interceptor way better than a multi-role fighter, and it's also going to shoot that bitch down way better. Generally, a tactical bomber is going to kill any enemies on the ground way better than a multi-role fighter. It's the jack of all trades, or the jack of none. Earlier in the game, you're not really going to be using any of these, but they will become more and more prominent towards modern day, as in real life, Multi-role fighters are pretty much all we use. We don't really use interceptors anymore these days. Now moving on to strat bombers. And I feel like explaining this with the B2 spirit is a little excessive, but at least it helps drive my point home, I guess. These things are going to have generally very, very long move range. And outside of this OP, like modern day equivalent here, they're going to be mainly used for fortification or structure attacks. They're, these are what you're going to use to basically carpet bomb an enemy city or defensive position into submission with the goal of destroying the actual structures itself instead of the units on them, kind of like a engineer demolition unit. Generally, in terms of planes, these are also going to have the highest max missile size, meaning if you're going to bomb the shit out of someone with air to ground missiles in terms of like nukes or you're going to drop an atom bomb, it's going to be done with a strat bomber. Now, as we saw, even the multi-rolls in modern day can get their missile size up there. The F-35C Lightning here could actually drop the atom bomb with a missile size like this. But in terms of keeping up with the times, this is what strat bomber is going to be used for. Generally, they are defensive enough. They're more defensive than tack bombers, I would say. And they can move so fast and so far that you can generally trust them to go by themselves. Ideally, you want them to have an interceptor escort, but that could be difficult given that these are designed to fly well beyond the range of your more conventional air forces. Pair them up with interceptors when you can, just like tack bombers, but whereas I would never use tack bombers by themselves, strat bombers are the things I would use by themselves. Because just for example, let's imagine World War II, you have the America bomber as Germany, and you want to send them over here, well, they can make a trip and back with nukes and be fine. But to actually get interceptors to them, you'd have to be based out of Canada. So you see the difference in use here. Even if you didn't put nukes on them, you could still bomb the shit out of New York, but you need to get so close to get interceptors there that it might just make sense to use tack bombers instead if you actually had that range. But do beware, using strat bombers, enemy fighters, will be dangerous to you, and generally, strat bombers cannot fire back even remotely. And now patrol planes. Now, this is really, really difficult and really, really easy to explain. There's a lot of these. There's planes, there's helicopters, there's drones. Some of them have combat stats and can stand up to air targets for cheaper, but not as well as an interceptor. Some of them can hit ground targets for cheaper, but not as well as attack bomber. Some of them can go really, really far, but then they have no combat stats because they're literally just there to patrol. They're recon. That is the primary use of patrol planes is recon. They just have combat options in some cases. So their spotting distances are going to be pretty much the highest out of all the air units. Between planes and drones, I'm sure you can figure out the difference of why you might want some instead of the others such as no personnel cost for a drone, whereas there is personnel cost for the other planes, manpower is an issue, of course. But then there's also patrol helicopters. And now this can be any kind of helicopter. It can be unarmed, specifically meant for recon. 
It can have ASW capabilities. It can have ground capabilities. It can fire at air. It's really so disorganized. It's hard to tell you exactly what or how to use these, except just note, patrol units are generally going to fit every other capability I've just explained and that I will explain with transport as we see here with cargo capacity. They will fit all of those roles and more in that they're also designed to actually recon. Just note, the thing they're going to be best at is being cheap and recon. They're not going to be best at any other of these roles. And they're usually based off of designs from the other roles, so some of them can be atrociously expensive, whereas others can be really cheap. And finally, transport planes and helicopters. Now, this kind of goes like transport trucks. They're going to have a cargo capacity. You can fill that up with fuel or supplies. It'll be done automatically. Fly that over to an area where you have ground targets engaging in combat and they will drop automatically while flying over their cargo to support those units, keeping them supplied. Now, of course, the benefit helicopters have in every one of these categories is the fact that they don't need to be based out of an actual air base or field. A plane has to make it from the base to the target and back. A helicopter can load up and actually advance with the push and just drop supplies the whole time without needing to worry about fuel because, well, they're going to be resupplying fuel the whole time and can pretty much do it out of their own cargo capacity. And you don't need to move them very far back to get more. But of course, the helicopters are close targets. The planes generally will not be. Well, the Osprey is, but that's a VTOL and that's very different and very specific. As you can see, transport can also get a little complicated. The fucking Osprey is a transport that has combat capabilities. Like, this, this gets so complicated in modern day. This tutorial would have been so much easier to make in an older setting. But then we also have, in more modern day, fuel tankers. Because it's not already complicated enough. And like I explained, units will explain if they're tankers or can be refueled by air. These are going to be used basically for the same purpose as other transport things, but they're going to be used specifically to refuel fuel out of their own fuel reserves, ignore the cargo capacity, because that's really just for supplies, and they can refuel anyone that is a plane that can be refueled by a tank. Now what this means since they don't have a cargo capacity is they can't pick up units like these guys can. For example, this plane has a cargo capacity, and anything with a cargo capacity can pretty much pick up a unit and transport it. So if you want to airdrop, you need something with cargo capacity. If you want supplies, you need something with cargo capacity. If you want fuel, well, that doesn't really matter. You just need something with fuel. I've kind of already explained how you can use transports to assist operations with prior units, so I don't think I really need to go any more in depth about that, but now we can quickly mention how to best use your air and land units together if that's what you have available to you. For example, if you're going on the offensive, it might be wise to, you know, send up your tanks, infantry, recon, that main force supported by whatever you can support them by, and use the air specifically when you are already assaulting with ground units to avoid the air actually taking a lot of damage because AA might be ready for you in the fortified positions and these targets won't be very good against fortified positions with exceptions or what they'd be most optimally used for but is hard to use them for is operating over giant swaths of territory that have no defensive locations let's say there's a giant tank battle happening out in these fields and forests here well you can just well maybe not this this is a dense forest okay a desert that's much better you could fly in interceptors to deal with any enemy aircraft like helicopters and planes and you could use your tactical bombers to fly in and easily bombard anything out in the fields including enemy tanks heavy enemy expensive units and this is where helicopters of course are perfect as well with the exception of you know some patrol things asw things this is generally how you want to use your air force missiles change everything again but that's like modern day exclusive it gives a lot more range and versatility to all your air units, but they're still going to serve the same functional roles. Now moving on to ships. Submarines. Now, I'm sure you can guess by history 
and real life how these are used. If you start really far back in time, the early submarines are going to be all short range submarines. There's a lot of short range basically patrol submarines, but they all go into the submarines category instead of having a patrol category for themselves because Battle Goat is consistent. Short range submarines, which are only going to be really in the older parts of this game, are going to be perfect for patrolling waters and keeping higher profile enemy targets out of your coastal waters in a way that also protects you from their attack because they're very, very good against enemy ships, generally pretty decent against other submarines if they can find them. Their profile is gigantic, so they're usually impossible to see without the help of a screen of destroyers, or in this case, escort ships. And as time goes on, they get longer range and longer range and more expensive until you eventually get to nuclear submarines, which can live at sea in terms of their actual fuel capacity. Of course, they will need more armaments, but there are coastal seawaters and transports that can take care of that just fine, especially if you have an alliance network which allows you to refuel in others' territories. Submarines are a perfect ship to specialize in and prioritize if your enemy is packing massive capital ships, not a lot of escort ships, or just generally has a much larger patrol or otherwise surface fleet than you have. And then carriers, which are generally going to be fairly long range. They're generally going to have no capacity to engage ships or land targets by themselves. A lot of them will have terrible anti-air defenses. Some of them will have very good anti-air defenses. They tend to be as expensive and defensive otherwise in terms of their armor as a capital ship would. You never want to send these out alone. And if you're going to be using these, you're going to be micromanaging them because the AI does not know how to use these and there's no way to teach the AI how to use these. For this, you're going to put your planes that have the ability to base off of carriers on here and helicopters for short deck carriers. And then the ideal way to use them is just keep them protected by a screen of other ships and use them to project the power of your air force and the utility that an air force can provide to foreign invasions primarily where your own land air force is not going to be able to reach very useful if you're sending strat bombers out by the way they could support the strat bombers in their opportunity attacks by being off the coast and then bowing out before things get too hot since they can sail away which an air base cannot and now capital ships which are going to be the main arm i want to say the main gun of your navy throughout the game until you get to modern day because in real life we don't actually use capital ships anymore we pretty much only use destroyers now this game makes up for that sort of by classifying some modern day destroyers as capital ships but generally speaking cap ships are where you're going to get your oh yeah look at this anti-submarine capability holy shit this is a destroyer <laughs> basically this is uh the cap ships let's look at the iowa it's a better example is where you're going to get massive range and surface attack against enemy ships if you're going to have any ship that's going to be amazing at destroying enemy surface fleets it's going to be cap ships and their range is always usually really really good their defense is always really really high there are shorter range cheaper and less tanky versions of them but generally all cap ships are going to work the same but they are also usually pretty slow as a result and they usually until modern day where destroyers become cap ships cannot defend themselves against submarines they in world war ii sometimes can have pretty good anti-air defenses but some of them as we can see don't a big part of why is just because well this is a cold war one and as of the cold war to modern day anti-ship and ship to air missiles end up dominating naval warfare and that's why cap ships become pretty irrelevant because they're just these sitting floating targets later in the game so your best ships of world war one and world war two as of the cold war in modern day are just going to stop holding up whereas it's interesting that a world war one cap ship can hold up very well in world war two its big weakness is going to be submarines for anti-ship utility world war ii cap ships can rival a lot of modern day ships in terms of raw attack power especially with their defensive capabilities but they're going to be lacking missiles and that's what's going to decide a lot of fights missiles and in terms of bringing carriers air capacity you want to pair cap ships up with escorts as much as possible because otherwise submarines are going to sink them 
sending them out with carriers is not really necessary because they both kind of fulfill the same role. Massive firepower. They just do it in different ways. As so long as you have, depending on the era, their missiles or your carriers equipped, a regular capital ship will be the perfect anti-surface fleet tool that you will have until later in the game. They're also generally very good for land bombardment. If you're going to use anything for land bombardment in terms of ships, it's going to be cap ships or carriers. The AI does know how to use cap ships, though. They don't know how to use carriers. So you see, you got to really pick. You can do both, but beware. One is more micro-intensive than the other. Now we move on to escort ships, which I feel like I've already explained enough upon getting to this point. Let's look at an old one, because those are just... Oh, we don't have very many old ones. Okay, never mind. Well, that's fine. Generally, escorts are going to be great at patrolling your coastal waters. They're like a step up from patrol boats in terms of their anti-air, anti-ship, and ASW capabilities, and even their ability to bombard. They are literally just more expensive patrol craft, and usually they can go farther. These are what you're going to be wanting to send with your capital ships and as well as your carriers. These are your escorts. That's what they're for. They're patrol ships on crack that go farther. And if you're rich, you could just use these instead of patrol ships. Honestly, they're tankier. They're just better in every way. They're just not cost efficient for actually protecting your shores. I mean, just look at the fucking Zumwa. Look at these stats. Like, do I need to say any more? It has great missile capacity, amazing range. It can defend against every type of air. This thing could shoot nukes out of the fucking sky. Every kind of plane. It can hurt enemy ships very well. Enemy submarines would be hard pressed to deal with this thing. It's great against land, although, you know, it's a modern day thing. This is much different than what you'd experience earlier in the game where escorts aka destroyers are really just going to be for asw purposes and screening your bigger ships pair them that's how you use them patrol ships i feel like i've already explained these are basically scaled down escorts that can't go nearly as far some of them especially older ones don't even have asw capabilities but especially around world war ii they gain them their defenses are worse everything about them is worse but they're a lot fucking cheaper this is the backbone of cheaper, poorer navies, and I would recommend using these, especially if you don't plan on using a lot of force projection or if you have financial difficulties. Otherwise, they fulfill the exact same role that escorts do, just they're more focused on your coastal waters than they are waging a war in the Pacific, for example. And finally, transport ships. They are literally the same thing as transport planes and transport units on land. They have cargo capacity, you move them around, they can refuel ships, they can resupply ships, there's not much else to say. They can transport land units for naval invasions if you have dedicated landing craft which is uh, usually something more like this. Earlier on, they'll all be pretty much defenseless, but dedicated landing craft can be used to actually shoot at anyone that is on the location that you are trying to besiege, essentially, and amphibiously land on. Amphibious land units, though, come with their own unarmed merchant marine landing craft, so player usage of these is really, really more min-maxi. So only get these if you really need to pull off a difficult amphibious invasion if landing at ports is not really an option these are perfect for that otherwise just the regular transports that don't have that you know they're just for refueling things don't try to use them in combat some of them might have some amount of defenses but they're generally pretty defenseless these are a utility to your fleet not a main component of them the landing craft are very micro heavy Whereas the actual supply ships, your AI will use a little bit better, but maybe not perfectly. And then missiles. So this one's gonna be real quick. All missiles are pretty much the same. They are shot from a platform and they target a platform. They'll either target land, air, or naval. They'll either be launched by land, air, naval, or silo, if you wanna count that. Generally, silo is just gonna count nukes. Nukes are pretty obvious. You load them up, and you nuke a place into oblivion. You know, how do you use this with your other units? Well, you fucking don't. You just nuke something into oblivion. We almost did it to the Chinese in the Korean War, and my God, can you imagine history class if we did? But there are also non-nuclear missiles. 
which have their purposes, pretty much. They can be found under every single one of these categories, though, because there's land to land, there's land to air, there's air to ship, there's ship to land, ship to ship. They're all very versatile. And some of these, uh, let's find one, can actually do kind of like everything at once. You can see right here what a missile is capable of. All right, so here's an example. We have the Tomahawk here, which can be shot by subs and naval launchers, and they perform a saturation attack, meaning they just basically target a fucking hex. Above it, we have the Harpoon, which is actually an anti-ship missile, meaning it's only gonna be good for shooting ships. There's also the guidance systems, like smart bombs versus cruise missiles. This doesn't matter too much, but it basically affects how far your missile can get generally. In real life, this has more meaning than it does in game. In game, it's just more a representation of technology. Missiles will also change between close or other air target types, and that will tell you how vulnerable they might be. There are building attacks. These are good for going after structures. There's ground target attacks. These are good for just targeting units specifically, you know, rather than everything on the hex or specifically the structures. For the first half of the game, most of the eras, you won't even really use these. You're primarily going to use these in modern day and they're just gonna be loaded onto your units and become another bit of firepower in the units. There's nothing more to micromanaging them than making sure you load up the right ones, but honestly, the AI loads up pretty well, even if you don't want to min-max this part. And that's it. That is all of the unit types in this game and how I would suggest micromanaging them and going about using them together. This took me an hour and a half to record and it's gonna take me way longer to edit, get ready, and actually get on YouTube. So if you wanna help make these informative videos possible more often as well as the other content I do, consider leaving a super thanks under the video or supporting me via the description by becoming a YouTube channel member, by becoming a patron or subscribing on my Gilded server. If you have any ideas for other guides or videos, please leave them in the comments below. A big thank you to everyone who's financially supporting. Up to this point where I recorded this video, their names will be on screen somewhere around now. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.